one of the fascinating questions that we're now starting to address is, if you had an Earth, if you had our own planet, but very, very far away, so you couldn't fly there, could you still identify it? And the answer is actually yes, because our planet, this pale blue dot, has an atmosphere that you and I breathe. And so basically, the things that you have in the atmosphere, those molecules, you can pick up remotely just by looking at the light from that planet. And so if you do that, if you catch the light from the planet, and then you split it up in its colors, you see that in some of these colors or wavelengths, there's less of an intensity. And so that tells you what is in the atmosphere, in the air of that planet. Oxygen in combination with a reducing gas like methane is really a fingerprint of life because then you have to invoke biology to produce so much of the oxygen. That's really the spectral fingerprint of life that you're looking for. And that tells you whether that planet has a similar atmosphere than we do and if there could be life like we. So when during the whole orbit of a planet is it a good time to look? And so basically you have a star and you have the planet that goes in front of the star. So at that point in time, yes, the planet blocks part of the really bright hot surface of the star, but at the same time, part of the stellar light gets filtered by the planetary atmosphere. It's in primary transit and primary eclipse. The other way how you can do it is actually, so the planet goes, this is the star, so the planet goes around the star. So at one point, when the planet is as far away from the star as possible, in a way, so you can block out the stellar light by a mask, by a coronagraph, for example, then you can just get the planet as a tiny point of light. And again, so you, you basically take that light, collect it in a big telescope, and split it up in its own colors and its wavelengths to figure out what is in its atmosphere. And so one of the big problems that you of course have in all this endeavor, you have a star, really bright one. And if you just take our own sun and you take our Earth, you can basically fit the Earth a hundred times next to each other into the diameter of the sun. And so trying to get the light or find this planet and catch the light to tell something about its atmosphere is, of course, an incredibly hard problem because you have a tiny planet and you have a big star very close to it. So it's a small signal next to a very big other signal that you have to find. The signal is really, really small. So this is one of the challenges, and this is why it's only nowadays that we have the technology in hand, the telescope starting to be big enough for us to be able to do it. And for real Earth, we'll still have to wait for the follow-up of Hubble. Hubble comes down, James Webb Space Telescope's going up. That's our first opportunity to collect enough light from such small planets to look whether or not they are keen or the same as our own Earth, or they're very different. So when you're trying to work on this, when you're trying to figure out how life on other planets could be like, what you really want to do is you want to take every information that you have from life on our own planet in any niche environment, anything you know, like really early on, really young Earth, and then say, OK, if this changes, what changes? If that changes, what changes? So you should really know the Earth very well, very well and then also the other planets around it to do that. And put that all together in a mix, in a puzzle, so to say, to figure out how other planets could be like and how they could present themselves. Because we cannot fly there. These things are light years away. We just have to get a telescope big enough to get enough of that light to extract the information uh, for another star or now because they're big enough also for other planets. So currently, what is so exciting about this field is that the technology has advanced so that we, for the first time in human history, think about this thousands of years, people have speculated if we were alone in the universe, if there could be life out there. 
For the first time in human history, we have big enough telescopes coming online that actually can find such small planets and also can characterize them, basically analyze, analyze their light. So one of the ones that is coming up, one of the big telescopes is called the James Webb Space Telescopes. It's the follow-up of Hubble. So the James Webb Space Telescope is a 6.5 meter telescope, just takes three and a half times me. That's how big the thing is. And this allows you to just collect enough light from such a tiny, tiny point in space, like a planet that is Earth-sized, tiny and not very bright, to characterize it. But of course, on the other hand, what we also do is we're working on this from the ground. There are big telescopes that we're building on the ground and mostly in areas where there's nice weather. So if you become an astronomer, that's a definite plus because you don't want to have a lot of clouds above your telescope that would defeat the purpose of trying to look at the sky. Uh, so Hawaii, Arizona, um, Chile are really good points. You're usually in the middle of the desert, dry. But we're also building telescopes from the ground. So one that is going to come online, uh, probably 2025, so a couple of years still, is called the European Extremely Large Telescope. And yes, I have no idea how we're going to name the next one, maybe EEE, -E -E, Extreme, Extreme, Extreme. But it's a 40 meter telescope. So 40 meter is really big. So basically 40 meter is more than 20 times me. So. That is one of the biggest ground-based telescopes that we're building currently. And on the US side, we're also building two 20-meter telescopes. It's like half the size. Uh, uh, but those ones will be the first ones from the ground that allow us to characterize smaller planets. And from the ground, you need much bigger telescope than you do from space, because as you know, you have the air between us and space if you put the telescope on the ground. And there's wind, there's hotter areas of the air, colder areas of the air. So basically what it does, it actually makes the air move above your telescope and then smears out your picture if you want. Like if you take a picture of your digital camera on a really hot day close to the road surface, you see that it flimmers. That's a similar problem we have when we look from the ground. So the telescopes from the ground need to be bigger. But within the next 10, 15 years, there's a couple of really exciting ground-based and space-based telescopes coming online. And one you shouldn't forget is a very small one that's called TESS, that it's built here at MIT and at Harvard and with a couple of other industrial partners. But the exciting thing about it is only going to be very small telescopes, four telescopes about this size, 60 centimeters. But what it will do, it will basically look at the whole sky and look which of these closest, brightest stars have such small planets going in front of them and blocking part of the light. Because of course, the closer the star to us that has such a planet, the more of the light of the planet we can grab per second or per minute or however long you observe. So the closest worlds, of course, fascinating because at one point we might be able to go to there, but the closest worlds also allow us to characterize the smallest planets. And so this is why it's a very exciting step. 2017, TESS is going to go up. In 2018, the James Webb Space Telescope should follow. And that will then look at the targets we identified and try to figure out if they could be a key to our own planet or not. So I was saying the telescopes are coming online within the next 5, 10, 15 years. So there's kind of a waiting period in a way. But what we're doing is we're learning as much as we can from the planets we know already. So that's our own solar system. And they're especially Earth, Mars, and Venus, the rocky ones that have atmospheres. And what we're saying is now, OK, we will have these instruments. But really, the planets, as far as we look around, they are bigger, they are smaller, they are colder, they are hotter. And we know how the Earth looks like, so how the biosignatures on the Earth, how we can find life on the Earth, how we can identify it. But of course, if the planet were bigger, if it were smaller, cooler, hotter, drier, wetter, whatever you want to pick, then these biosignatures, or the signatures in the atmosphere, would change. And if life changed, if it were an extreme life form, they again would change. And so what we are doing, and my team, is we're actually creating 
a database of spectral fingerprints for life under different conditions. Uh, you know, as much as we can put in there, as much as we know, there'll be a wide parameter space that we don't know, life we don't know, their signatures. But for everything we can envision and we know from the Earth, we're putting this now together into a spectral database, if you want. It's like when you're in a crime scene and you're trying to figure out who did it, right? It's basically which planet could provide um, conditions for life, which planets cannot. And in a way, how good does my instrument have to be to pick it up, to not miss it? Because as soon as we have these telescopes online, we want to get a, a, a running start. We want to know how long you have to observe before you can say, okay, this planet is more interesting than that one, or this planet, okay, we need to really put a lot of our time into. And so what we're looking into is the different kind of life on our own planet. And then we model how, if it dominated the planet, that would actually look like, or if we could pick that, pick that up remotely. And so these are parts of it. And then on the other hand, we move the planet further away from the star, closer in. We make it bigger, we make it smaller. We make it, for example, an ocean planet. So basically a planet where the water is everywhere and so if you had a wave that wave would never break so if you like to surf that's definitely where you would want to be or if you dive the really fascinating thing about it is like you would dive and you know that the pressure becomes bigger and bigger the further you dive down because of all the mass of water above you but at one point it would actually hit a pressure where even though it's warm you would start to form ice not the ice that floats on the surface, but high pressure ice. And so these kind of worlds will, of course, have a completely different uh, structure in terms of how much you get out from the rocky core and how much gets in the atmosphere and how, again, it presents itself, what condition it could give for life and how good we'd have to observe things to pick that up. And these are some of the fascinating open questions that we currently work on to be ready at the point where we take the first spectrum to A, say, this one is kind of more interesting than this one, we think. So pick, put all of your time on that one. And then also, once we get the data, the light from the planet back to say, ooh, this looks kind of like that one or that one, so somewhere in between. And they say like, okay, so when we now take the data and improve our models to understand this light years away planet better, then we are like really fast and we don't have to do hours and, well, hours we'll have to do, but years and years of work uh, to figure it out because our telescopes are up in space for five to 10 years. So you really want to use every minute of that. What are the open questions? How can we actually figure out if another planet has life? It sounds pretty straightforward. Just look at it, have a look at its atmosphere. But there's a lot of questions here. So for example, look at our own Earth. So in the beginning, the Earth was hotter as far as we know. Life pretty much immediately developed. But signature, Signatures that basically indicate life in the atmosphere come on about after half of the Earth's life. Because the life in the beginning on our own planet produced CO2, methane, and this can also be produced just by geology, just by outgassing of rocks. So it's not a unique sign to tell you that there's life on a planet. So you have to take into account the changing environment of the planet. And if it starts to have life that produces oxygen and that then accumulates in the atmosphere, this is when we can start to pick it up without it being kind of an ambiguous sign whether or not there's life or not. And so with each gas or with each indication, biosignature as we call them, you need to be very, very critical. You need to say, okay, do I have any other explanation? And if there is, it's probably a bit premature to say that you found life. Extraordinary discoveries, extraordinary evidence. Of course, another thing that's very funny is like, we're looking for life as we know it. But if you just look at the Earth, the diversity of life is incredible. Look at the deep oceans, the things we find. Look at these extremes environment like salt lakes, frozen areas, or 
I don't know, acid lakes. You know, there's life there too. Or if you ever go to Yellowstone, all those beautiful colors usually indicate life there. This is extreme forms of life. So we call them extremophiles. And we only call them extremophiles because you and me really wouldn't do very well in these environments. We would kind of die pretty fast. But there are other uh, life that developed for these specific circumstances. So it's very easy to actually envision another planet to just be a tad colder, so completely frozen over, or hotter, or maybe it's acid, who knows? You know, maybe it's a complete ocean. And then, of course, such extreme life forms as we already know on the Earth could become the dominant life form. And so it's really, really important to keep your view wide open because a lot of things that could kill us will not kill life per se, right? Life is very versatile. So, of course, not to think about us if you go and look for life out there, but broaden it out a little bit. Right? So we're trying to understand life on the Earth in its extreme environments and see how we could look for these kind of life on other planets. And a completely different question is still, what about if life were based on different chemicals? You should think about what kind of different life you could envision because we can look for what we know how to look for. But on the other hand, chances are that life could be very different out there. So that's another really fascinating part of the search. What are we going to find? Part of it will be able to say, oh, this looks like life on the Earth. But probably part of it is going to be, oh, wow, this could be life. What could we envision it to be? It's an open question, highly debated. So I can't give you a good answer to that. So look into it, help us out. But there are two arguments. So one argument is that if you look uh, around the universe, you see water kind of everywhere, hydrogen, and you see carbon kind of everywhere. So this seems to be very, very plausible as basics of life, as, and life as we know it is based on carbon and water. You could argue that other things could also be used for life, for example, silicate or other things that you can come up with. But the question really is, what kind of conditions would you have to find for life that, as we know, is really good in taking the stuff that's around it and building itself up and developing and so on and so forth? What condition would you actually have to encounter for life to say, OK, I see a lot of carbon, I see a lot of water, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to go and try to base myself on silicate. And so it's interesting just to think about it. We cannot exclude it. And this is also why it's really fascinating to look for life out there, to learn more. Because of course, Earth is one example and would really, really want to have a second one. But um, there's no real reason to think life should pick other chemistry. But of course, uh, this has been an incredibly surprising field so far. And we cannot make life in the lab. So we cannot tell you that it couldn't use anything else. So that's one of the fascinating points. Keep your eyes open. Design a mission for what you know you can design it for. And then keep your eyes open for other interesting signals to learn more about what life could actually be based on or what condition other habitats could provide.